right here, right now, in this place, at this time, we've assembled most of the world's experts on psychedelic science, on the science of the mind, therapy, on psychedelic spirituality, on the mind, the heart, and the spirit. And the eyes of the world are on us. And they're on us because these tools connect us to what most makes us human, to love, to spirituality, to meaning, to forgiveness, to healing. There's an intense interest in what these tools can bring us to into the human spirit. And because there is this interest, there also is this necessity on our part to try to refine what we're doing. As we gather momentum, right now there's more psychedelic research taking place than at any time in the last 40 years. We're, we're still in the fledgling stages, but we're through the groups that are all represented here, through Dave Nichols and the Hefter Research Institute, and Amanda Fielding and the Beckley Foundation, and Bob Jesse and the Council on Spiritual Practices, all of us working together. The success of this conference is due only because we're all working together. And we've brought this community together. And as we start completing the various pilot studies that we're doing, as we start getting promising results, we're going to be gathering momentum. And it's like, uh, like a wind tunnel almost. As you gather speed, little imperfections that didn't matter that much when you were going slower suddenly can veer you off course. So we're having a conversation here. And I encourage all of you to bring your skeptical minds, to bring your fears to the surface, to bring your doubts, and to ask the speakers to have a dialogue here that refines and polishes and makes what we are trying to accomplish more likely to move to the next stages. I'd like to acknowledge the incredible hard work, passion for their work, and courage of the MAPS staff for really working. <laughs> Um, um, I'd like to also acknowledge my wife, Lynn, and um, my 15-year-old my son, Eden, my 13-year-old daughter, Lila, and my 11-year-old daughter, Eliora. <laughs> <I've, laughs> now, when... Um, Ellie would like me to tell a story about her, but I'm actually going to tell a story about Lila. <laughs> uh, last night when they came in and they were um, understanding, sensing the magnitude of this event and looking at the program, Lila turned to me and she said, but is there cotton candy? <laughs> so at our next conference, uh, <laughs> we will have fried dough and cotton candy <laughs> and balloons. <laughs> I've, I've learned about love uh, with my family, and then they have shown me that they've let me go. I've been away from home a third to a half the time for a very long time. I've traveled the world trying to knit a community together, to knit research studies to help them. I've been away from home, but my family has really understood, and they've, they've joked that I, I must have a second family somewhere. <laughs> Um, and I do, I do. It's the people that I work with, and it's this community here. The moment that we are now sharing together is just very precious. And it's taken so much for all of us to be here. There's an opportunity here. I've been thinking about this conference for many, many years. And we've had several different dates that we would abandoned because it didn't feel like we were ready. And finally, we set this date, we've stuck to it, and all of you here have testified it is ready. This was the right time. And in part, it's the right time because I, we've learned the lessons of the 60s. 
some of the key parts of what splintered this whole society apart. I think for me, one of the key lessons is that there is no hope in counterculture. There is no away. There is no island utopia. There is no way that we can be safe and free outside of a dominant culture. That we have to have our goal be to move into the heart and be part of the mainstream. And we are, if we look at all of us here, um, how much we've contributed. So I think just that identification of where we're going, we're, we're trying to be, and we are being accepted. And I, I have thought that this was going to be a plea, like a message in the bottle, to show all the different topics, the things we were working on that were bubbling up, and to show to the society, let us be free, let us continue, do not have another backlash, do not lock us out of the laboratories. And over the last several months, I've been coming to realize that it's not a plea. This conference is not a plea. Our plea has been asked and answered. And we do have the opportunity to do the work that we're talking about. Regulators all over the world are saying, if you bring us rigorous, methodologically wise protocols, we will eventually <laughs> give you permission. <laughs> the, the funders have said, if you can show us that you can use this money efficiently and strategically and leverage it, as we're doing through the public education, we will fund your endeavors. The patients have been saying, we will bring our pain and our suffering and our struggles to you to see if you can help. And the researchers and therapists have been stepping up and saying, we will put ourselves to the test. We will put ourselves also under the microscope. We will be videotaped and audiotaped as we do therapy, and we will analyze ourselves. And so it's actually scarier to have permission and authorization. It's nice to be the voice in the wilderness saying, I've got the solution to the world's problems, but you won't let me prove it. And now that we have this opportunity to prove it, it's really kind of frightening. Because it's a lot harder to actually prove it than we might initially think. The research is more complicated. There's factors that we haven't realized that influence what we're doing. Trying to refine a method, trying to standardize a method, trying to teach a method. It's all much, much harder, but it's real and it's solid. And that's what makes our conversation here in this moment so critically important because there is such a need in the world for what we're trying to accomplish and there is such an incredible wealth of intelligence and good heart and courage in this room. Now, I've been hoping for this sort of, I've been working towards this since I was 18 years old and when I first took LSD. I was persuaded as I was growing up that one dose of LSD made you permanently crazy. And, and I really did believe that. And so it, it took a lot for me to try to start questioning that. It, it actually started with uh, One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, which I read and I thought, this is a fantastic book. And then a friend said, part of this was written under the influence of LSD. I was like, how can that possibly be? But what really motivated me was being born in 1953 into a Jewish family and growing up in the shadow of the Holocaust. And I've been traumatized sort of at a distance by this incredible ferocity of hatred and projection that people can permit themselves to engage in. And I've felt as I was growing up I, I needed to respond to that, that that was the biggest threat to my life. And then I started noticing all around me this ramp up to the Vietnam War and that I would be asked to fight. I was of draft age. I was the last year of the lottery. And I felt that that was a little bit of the same kind of process of demonization and projection and scapegoating. And it felt to me like I was not going to participate. And I decided to become a draft resistor and go to jail as an example.